Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Prosser United Methodist Church on this Sunday, second Sunday of April, April 14th, 2024. I'm Bo Bryan, the pastor. If you take a moment to look over the announcements that are in the bulletin and also the bulletin inserts, uh, just want to um, make sure you see that we've got the Native American Special Sunday offering. This is the envelope for it. There's some discussion inside the, on the page here written about what it is about and uh, goes to serve uh, Native American ministries within the United Methodist Church and around the, uh, our country here. Also, we have a guest pianist today. Reva had a bit of an accident this week and has a broken arm. And so she can't play piano. And so her friend, Teresa Hebbard, has, has joined, uh, said that she would uh, fill in for uh, Reva while Reva is recuperating here. And so welcome, Teresa, and thank you for doing that uh, uh, for us. And uh, Reva, well, I hope you recover well on that. Yeah. Good. We have a um, birthday person among us today, and that is Rita Eady. Um, and she has her birthday t tomorrow. Uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, let's sing happy birthday to Rita. Rita. Happy birthday. And I think there might be a treat downstairs related to that birthday uh, for coffee hour uh, that we might have available. Joyous and concern slips are on the back of the pews in front of you. If you have a joy or a concern, uh, go ahead and uh, use that slip to write out your joy or concern and share it. I will come and buy and uh, pick, uh, pick those up and then share them with you. Our worship leader this morning is Elisa Riley. That's right. Got that name right. Okay, Elisa Riley is our worship leader this morning, and she will lead us through the call to worship. I invite you to stand as you are able. The sound of the trumpet still lingers. The smell of Livy's hover in the air. The candy is not quite gone. It is still Easter. In the ordinary and routine, it is still Easter. The pulse of hope, the signs of new life, the spirit of peace, the containable joy, the urge to sing, it is still Easter. Please join me in the opening prayer. O oh, great spirit, whose voice we hear in the winds, and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear us. We come before you as your children. We are small and weak. We need your strength and wisdom. Let us walk in beauty and make our eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. May our hands respect the things you have made. Our ears be sharp to hear your voice. Make us wise so that we may know the things you have taught your people, the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. We seek strength not to be superior to our brother and sisters, but to live in harmony with ourselves and all your creation. Help us to be ever ready to come to you. So when life fades as a fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without shame. Amen. The gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 30, 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts look at my hands and my feet 
See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The New Testament reading this morning is from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by your own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, although he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witness, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Will you join me for a moment of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations upon each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The United Methodist Church has this saying, motto, however you want to name it. Uh, it says, open hearts, open minds, open doors. And so the next three weeks I'm going to be working with each one of those. And today I'm talking about open minds. And uh, kind of what those things mean for us. When I was in uh, college, uh, and uh, that was in the late 70s. Um, Open-mindedness was kind of a cultural thing going on back then that was talked about a lot. And I remember a guy in one of my classes saying, yeah, people got to be careful. They don't leave their minds open too much because everything will just fall right out, right? <laughs> Open-mindedness. Uh, open minds. That's not really what open minds is about. It's not about catching everything and, and you know a lot of people he struggled with you know, well, well what do you believe then if you're open-minded you believe everything you can't believe everything there's contradictory stuff out there what does it mean to be open-minded what does it mean to have an open mind let's start off with a couple of things that it's not it's not that that open uh, salad bowl or whatever it is that you just throw everything into and, and, and eat whatever's there uh, uh, from whatever's there. Uh, that's, it's not that at all. Open-mindedness is about listening to all things. It's about trying to understand all things, but it's not about believing all things. It's about being open to listening to other points of view, wanting to understand people who have different points of view than you have because you care about them, because you want to be in relationship with them. 
being open-minded is not about believing everything. It, the other thing that open-mindedness is not, and, and then I'll get into some of the other stuff uh, as, that it is, is it's not just a liberal thing. It's, it doesn't matter whether you're liberal or conservative, whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent, whether you're whatever category you fit into politically or socially or whatever, that's not about being open-minded. Open-minded is for everyone. Uh, open-mindedness is about being open to others and understanding others. And one of the things that we are experienced or have experienced, I think, in our culture over the last couple of decades is what has been called the closing of the American mind. Uh, where everybody has become sort of calcified into their position and their position is the only right position and we don't have to listen to anyone else and everybody else is wrong. And that only creates separate silos for people who want to believe what they believe and not hear anybody else. And to some degree, uh, the, the modern technology has kind of increased that because now you can get together online with all the people who believe exactly what it is that you believe and exclude every other idea that there is out there. You don't have to listen to those or understand those. That Closing of the American Mind was the title of a book written by a professor at University of Chicago back in the 1980s, mid-80s. Um, Alan Bloom and a student at that university uh, has written another book his name is David Brooks uh, and he has written a book more recently a more autobiographical kind of book named uh, called the second uh, mountain David Brooks you may have heard he is on PBS uh, he's a he's a columnist with the New York Times he's also on PBS on Fridays and he is part of the political commentary team of Brooks and Capehart, and Brooks uh, re uh, represents the uh, Republican side and Rick Capehart the Democratic side, and, and they have conversations about issues each week. Although um, Brooks is a lot more moderate than, uh, than our current uh, Republican, uh, what we hear in the media from Republicans. Because Brooks went to the University of Chicago when Alan Bloom was a professor there. And he learned and, uh, um, the, the kinds of stuff about, that is about having an open mind. One of the things that Brooks talks about in his book is that Chicago, and it was one of the few institutions still doing it back then when he was going to college, still required you to read the old Latin uh, and, and um, Greek philosophers back, uh, Sophocles and, and Plato and, and Socrates and Virgil and those kinds of things and the classics, what we call the classics of literature. That's what school, what university used to be about. It used to be about edging, educating people about the classics literature out there, not about what it has become, which has become uh, much more of a training center for you to get a job, uh, wh whatever field you're looking in, whether it's chemistry or biology or engineering or um, teaching or whatever the uh, um, uh, areas that you want to study. Colleges today pretty much are geared toward that. They don't require that you take the classical courses anymore. You might have to take an English class but or um, maybe some PE. I don't know if they still do PE even in college uh, anymore. I know I had to take some swimming classes when I was uh, going through that. So it's, it's changed. Our educational system is much more focused on becoming a vocational system so that people can get jobs when they get out of school and, and then go on with their lives. But what David Brooks found is that when you get to, to the top of that mountain, you've got the degrees or the education that you needed, you've got the jobs that you needed, you've got the family, you've got everything, you've got the, the home, and then you find there's still something more. There's something more that life is about. 
And then you start working on the second mountain. Part of that second mountain is opening our minds. Jesus does that, actually. It actually uses that phrase. Jesus opened the minds of the disciples when he took, uh, talked with them. This was the first, in Luke's gospel, this was the, the first experience of the disciples seeing Jesus after the resurrection. And, and they are um, afraid. They think it's a ghost, you know. And he says, no, no, I'm real. You know, touch me. Give me something to eat. I'll eat something. And then he opens their minds about the scriptures and what that implies or what that infers is that they get an understanding now of what the scriptures were really saying, what Jesus was really saying through his teachings, that this was all leading to this, this resurrection, this new life that we all have. Now they didn't all still get it. Even though they had their minds opened by Jesus in this, Luke is also the author of, of the book of Acts, and in next month we will be talking about the ascension. And at that point, just as Jesus is ascending to heaven, there's a couple of disciples who are still saying, hey, is this the time now when you're going to kick Rome out of Jerusalem? No, you haven't got it yet. Keep listening. Keep working on that. Opening our minds is about, or having open minds, I guess I should say, is about being curious. It's about wondering. What is it that other people are like? What is it that they're talking about when they talk about that that I don't understand? And it sounds kind of scary to me, and I've tried to stay away from it for most of my life, but maybe there's something I need to learn from that or need to hear about that so that I can at least understand them better. And this is part of why we have so many denominations of Christianity. Jesus started off uh, with, you know, opening the minds of the disciples. Peter is there and he has changed. Uh, very much so. He's much more confident in this passage here in Acts because he is preaching now what Jesus was trying to, the point Jesus was trying to get across, that there's this new life, this new thing happening in the world. And so we are now doing something different. And the church begins. They been, begin collecting people. But when you read the scriptures, if you read uh, the letters, for instance, of John and Peter and Paul. They're very different kind of people. They train their congregations differently. They speak to their congregations differently and about different things. And yet they were all still Christian groups gathered together. And that's one of the things that Christianity has adapted to throughout the years is that and the centuries is that people are different and need different things De need to relate to God in different ways some ways are better for some people and other ways are better for others and so we have different monastic systems coming up you know the Benedictines and the Franciscans and the the, uh, all the, the other the, the, uh, Carmelites and others, they're all kind of focusing on different things, different aspects. And then we have the reformations that happen and, and people break off because sometimes the church did lose its way a bit. And so there were some reformations that, went, that happened uh, and, and corrections in, 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 in mid-course, even within denominations. John Wesley and his group of methodical people, methodical disciples, methodical uh, clergy uh, that gathered at Oxford and got together and had this very regimented sort of life, uh, realized that there was a whole group of people in England who were not going to church because they had to work on Sunday mornings. They were the ones out farming on Sunday mornings and they were the ones working in the mills on Sunday mornings and they were the ones working on the coal mines on Sunday mornings. And so he did something radical. 
he went out to the fields and to the coal mines and to the other places where they were all working, the factories and the mills. And he and his friends would preach. Just gather them together in the fields, gather them together outside the building and have a service right there. That was radical. The church didn't like it, Church of England. They told them to stop. But they knew that was the thing that needed to happen because they had listened and they had wondered about those people and said, why can't we go out and preach Christ to them? There are all kinds of people in our worlds. Even in our town. What are they like? Who are they? What drives them? Be curious about the people whom you fear or who grate against you that you try to avoid in life. I know um, I grew up in a social justice uh, church, uh, really good preachers and all, and um, I was, had, I don't know where I got this, but I just had this kind of fear of evangelicals. I don't know where that came from. Uh, I just thought, you know, they're, they're crazy. They're going to take me away or uh, make me a zombie or something. I don't know what I thought that was going to happen to me. Well, when I was at Benton City, a friend of mine that was the pastor at um, CUP in Richland. And uh, he started an evangelical convo, and he invited me to come. And he knew I wasn't an evangelical. Uh, we've been part of a first-year pastors group together. He knew who I was, had listened to me. He invited me to that, and I went. And I found out that they didn't turn me into a zombie. And they didn't try to eat my arms off or something like that. You know, they, they, were, they were just people. And they were reasonable people, even. And loving and caring people. And they, they were worried about the people who were starving around the world. And they were worried about housing the homeless. And they were worried about preaching Christ to all people. I thought, wow. This is great. And I went again the next year to the second convo that they had and met and talked with these people. I never really became an evangelical person, but I found out my fears were unfounded because I had opened my mind to the possibility that they were real people. That they were people who really loved God, loved Christ, and loved other people and they wanted to serve God in whatever way they could opening our minds is one of the first parts of changing who we are and how we relate to the world around us not just opening our minds to opinions it's about opening up our minds to others other human beings, to the world around us, to the sunsets that was mentioned in the opening prayer, to God's creation around us, to the love that exists in God's creation. That is what we are called to do. That is what Jesus was trying to call his disciples to do. Open up your minds. Open up your eyes. See that I am real. That I am here with you. It's what Peter was saying. I have this power to heal this person so that he could walk again because 
I have a whole new understanding of what the world is and who God is. Our work as human beings, our work as Christians is to continue to grow, always to grow. And we can only do that by being curious, by wondering, by listening, and by loving God and God's creation and all others, all human beings. I invite you to stand as you are able and turn in the back of the red hymnal to number 883. And let us read together this statement of faith entitled, The Statement of Faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, Proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. If you have joys or concerns uh, to share, raise your um, uh, slip of paper and I'll come and collect them. God of grace, we give you thanks for this world that you have created around us. For its beauty, the green of the hills, flowers and blossoms, the fresh air of spring, scents of lilac, we give you thanks for family, for friends, people we love and care for and who love and care for us. We give you thanks for neighbors, co-workers, people in our communities whose work makes our lives better. We give you thanks for the many ways in which you help us to wonder, nudge us to be curious. Lord, we pray for those people who are in need, for those who do not have enough food to eat, 
clean water to drink. For those who do not have shelter from the heat or the cold. We pray for those who are seeking to recover from natural disasters, floods, fires, hurricanes, earthquakes. We pray for people who are trying to recover from emotional harm and trauma. We pray for those who are seeking to live in a place of freedom. Lord, we pray that you will help these people and inspire us to share out of the abundance that we have from our resources. Lord, we pray for those who govern us in our local communities, in our states, in our countries. Guide these people. Help them to hear your word for their people. That they may be wise, make wise decisions. Lord, we pray for your church. Help us to hear you and the ways that you are constantly working in us and through us to others. We pray these things in the name of the risen Christ who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you now to turn to page 15 in the red hymnal for our communion liturgy. You will not have all of the words that I will be saying, but you will have the same uh, introductions from me to your parts, which are the, in the boldface print. As usual, uh, in the United Methodist Church, you do not need to be a member of this or of any church. You simply come forward down the center aisle, and uh, I will hand you a piece of bread. Elisa will, Riley will be holding a cup, and you can dip it into that, 
and you may kneel at the rail, altar rail if you'd like, uh, to uh, spend some time in prayer and then return to your seats by the side aisles there. Those of you at home, uh, if you want to pause your video if you haven't done so already to get a uh, piece of bread or cracker or something and something to drink to go with your communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from the captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, broke the bread, gave thanks to you, Lord, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Eat, this is my money given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you for it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and online and make these gifts uh, and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
Now go forth in the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Repay no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve our God in all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.